Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today's lecture will be taking up the first unit. So, students, what do you understand by the term developmental biology? And what do you think is the difference between developmental biology and the term embryology? So, first, if I say what is development? Development is the successive steps between the ontogeny and phylogeny of an organism. And during development, there can be two phases, embryonic phase and post-embryonic phase of an organism's life. So we can say the phase between fertilization and birth is embryology. And the phase after birth, which includes its growth, development, being into adult, then again reproducing, undergoing senescence or dying, that all phases are com coming under developmental biology. And developmental biology includes all aspects, that is the morphological, physiological, biochemical and genetic aspects of an organism's life. Actually, embryology was a term that was earlier used and today we use the term developmental biology. So first we will start with historical perspective of developmental biology. Students. Although ancient Indian and Egyptian studies mention a bit about the idea of embryos, but Aristotle is the one who is credited with the studies of developmental biology in a systematic way. He studied embryology of chick. He believed in the theory of spontaneous generation of organisms, which was though later revived in the name of epigenetic theory by Wolf in 1759. He proposed that menstrual fluid formed the substance of the embryo, while the semen gave it form and animation. In his text, The Generation Animalium, or The Generation of Animals, he mentions about both asexual and sexual forms of reproduction, and that animals may give birth by oviparity, viviparity, or ovoviviparity. No doubt, this great philosopher and a teacher is called the father of embryology. He is also credited with the discovery of holoplastic and meroplastic patterns of cleavage. And yes, he also discovered the role of mammalian placenta and umbilical cord in development. Then there was no significant embryological study during the medieval period called Dark Age of Science. During this period, it was simply assumed that the organisms arose by spontaneous generation. Embryology was revived by Fabricius, an Italian who published the first illustrated work on embryology. In 1651, William Harvey, an English anatomist and physician, worked on his principle Omne vivum ex ovo, that is, all life arises from the. It meant that all organisms, including mammals, originate from the egg. He was the first one to see the blastoderm of the chick embryo with this handheld lens. And yes, he is the same who discovered the circulation of blood in human body, as you must have started in your physiology class. Then in 1672, Rainer de Graaf described mature ovarian follicle, though he thought it to be over. In 1672, Marcello Malfeggi published the first microscopic account of chick development. He observed the neural groove and muscle forming somites. He was the first one to initiate the theory of preformation, which we will just study in the next few slides. In 1683, Leeuwenhoek discovered spermatozoa in human semen with his self designed microscope and he called them animalcules or zoa. Following this, Spelenzini in 1780 was the first to demonstrate cleavage in frog's egg and Fander in 1817 
is the first who discovered the three primary germ layers that is the ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm in the tick embryo. Then in the field of comparative embryology, H. Radke worked. He was the one who observed similarities in the development of fish, frog, salamander, bird and mammalian embryos. He was the first to identify the pharyngeal arches as you must have studied in your anatomy courses in the previous semester. He was the one who showed that these same embryonic structures become gill supports in fish. But since other mammals do not require gills, so they become jaws and ears in mammals. Carl Ernst von Beer studied chick development and also compared it with development in other vertebrates. He is credited with the discovery of notochord and mammalian egg. He gave four principles on the basis of his study. The four principles are, number one, the general features of a large group of animals appear earlier in development than do the specialized features of a smaller group. So students here we can say like all vertebrate embryos have gill arches, notochord and dorsal hollow nerve cord earlier in their development. But later on, the fishes develop scales, the mammals develop hair. Second point is less general characters develop from the more general ones until finally the most specialized ones appear. So students here we can say all vertebrates initially have the same type of skin, right? It's only later in development that the skin will develop fish scales, reptilian scales, bird feathers and the hair, claws and nails in mammals. The third point is the embryo of a given species instead of passing through the adult stages of lower animals departs more and more from them. So here we can take an example of pharyngeal arches again. The pharyngeal arches start off the same in all vertebrates, but the same pharyngeal arches become jaw support in fishes, which become part of the skull in reptiles, and they become part of the middle ear bones in mammals. And mammals never go through a fish like stage during their development. The fourth point states therefore, the early embryo of a higher animal is never like a lower animal, but only like its early. So human embryos, as we said, never pass through the stage of an adult fish or frog. Rather, human embryos initially share certain characteristics in common with the fish and avian embryos. But later on, they diverge from each other. Charles Darwin is the one who has contributed immensely in the field of evolutionary embryology. He studied von Beer's law and interpreted that the relationships between groups can be established by finding common embryonic or larval forms. Also, he found that adaptations that depart from the type and allow an organism to survive in a particular environment develop late in the embryo. He pointed out that embryonic organisms sometimes form structures that are inappropriate for them in their adult form. But these structures demonstrate their relatedness to other animals. For example, we can say the eyes in embryonic holes, pelvic bone rudiments in embryonic snakes, or we can say the teeth in baleen male embryos. So here is the one who laid the concept of homologous versus analogous organ. Ernst Haeckel in 1866 gave biogenetic law, also known as recapturation theory, again based on von Beer's law, which states that during development, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So this theory states that an animal in individual development from egg to adult, which is ontogeny, repeat all the stages through which its ancestors have passed in the course of evolution. And these stages means phylogeny, right? Then in 1876, Oscar Hertwig described the mechanism of union of the nucleus of sperm and ova during his study on sea urchin. So thus he confirmed the contribution of each sex in fertilization. In 1897, he demonstrated that the amount of yolk present in the ovum determines the type of cleavage. Next were the scientists who contributed in the field of mathematical modeling in studying embryology. J. Huxley was the first one in 1932. He applied the logarithmic equation to study allometric growth in animals. So students, what is allometric growth? 
it is differential rate of growth of different body parts unlike the isometric growth in which all the organs uh, grow at the same rate so in allometric growth different organs grow at different rates so how do we compare the growth rate of different body organs so this was given by a mathematical equation first of all by Huxley and the equation is y is equal to bx raised to power k or logarithmically log y is equal to log b plus k log x where y is the mass of body part at a given time and x is the mass of the full body. b is a coefficient which is equal to the mass of y when x is equal to 1. Right? Now what is k? k is basically the ratio of two factors a and c where a and c are the growth rates of two different organs. Now if k is equal to 1 it means that both the organs are growing at the same rate. If K is higher than 1, then the part A is growing faster than C. And if K is less than 1, that means that the organ C is growing faster than A. Then Turing in 1952 also gave another mathematical model known as reaction diffusion model. It helped in predicting pattern formation in embryos through computer simulated models. And his method has been applied in fish and butterfly pigmentation and also in studying the stripe pattern in zebra by various other researchers. Similar mathematical models like cell chemotaxis models were given by Keller and Siegel in 1970 and Patlack in 1963. They involve chemotaxis and amplification of these variants by localized chemical signals. And these models have also been applied in studying feather patterning and skin pigmentation patterns in snake. Now, the mechanochemical model based on extracellular metrics was also given by Oster, Bure, and Harris in 1980. So, students, then also we have certain theories of early developmental biology, or we can say the theories of early embryology. The earliest to be given was the preformation theory, which states that a preformed miniature organism or homunculus, as it was said, already exists in the head of the sperm or in the ovum. And that homunculus only mechanically unwraps to produce a new organism, as if the homunculus is cuddled very tinyly in the sperm head. And they even, the scientists even drew drawings of the same and they thought that they are imagining, they are seeing something in their dreams and this is the drawing which is showing a tiny person inside the sperm as drawn by Nicholas Hartzucker in 1695. And this theory had two schools of thoughts or the preformations. One school of thought was that the tiny animal cube existed within the head of sperm. And this group included the spermatists or animalculists. And in these were the scientists Leeuwenhoek, Hartsoker and Leibniz. The other group of people were the ovist, who believed that the tiny organism or the homunculus existed within the ovum. And this included Malpichi, Swimmerdam and Spilinson. Out of which Malpichi was actually the first one to give this theory. But soon this theory got a number of problems. For example, if all generations have been in existence, then it means each one should be there within each other from the very beginning of the world. That means that the very first embryo included within itself tiny copy of the second preformed embryo and also a third, a third embryo and also a fourth one and so on. Although this theory was supported by the theory of embodiment given by Charles Bovet, but it again failed. Also, the theory of Preformation could not explain the regeneration of lost body parts and also the intergestational variations. So then Charles Bonnet gave his theory of embodiment or encapsulation. Actually, he gave this theory just in support of theory of preformation. And he gave the concept of Russian dolls here, in which the dolls are packed one within the other. So he said similarly an ovum contains the preformed miniature of the future generation and even the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation and even the next generation. So miniature forms already existed in the very first ovum that was formed. Bonnet was the one who also discovered parthenogenesis in April. 
it's proving the possibility of asexual reproduction in animals. But this theory also could not stand for long. And C.F. Wolf came up with his theory of epigenesis. Wolf studied chick embryo development and he examined that the embryonic parts develop from tissues with no counterparts in the adults. And he found that an undifferentiated tissue containing all the material required to form an embryo already exists within an ovum. But it is just an undifferentiated tissue and not a complete organism already formed as the earlier theory of reformation stated. He also stated that during development, this tissue rearranges itself, not unfold, but rearrange itself into layers, which ultimately develop into embryo stem. And this literally meant epigen. Then came germplasm theory by Wiesmann in 1893. He gave a new term, germplasm, which is the hereditary material in the cells and Parents transmit to their offspring only this germ plus, which is present in the germ cells, that is the sperm and egg cells, not the somatic cells or the bodies. Right? Now, in 1904, Wiesman also proposed another thing, that every distinct part of an organism is represented in the sex cells by a separate particle. And each particle is called as the determinant. And the total body of an organism is actually nothing but the sum total of all those determined. Then came mosaic theory or determinate theory as given by Rox in 1888, who is known as the father of experimental embryology. Actually, he started doing experiments on embryos for the first. He did an experiment. He killed one blastomere of the frog embryo at two cell stage. And to his surprise, just half an embryo developed, probably from the live plastomere only. Thus, he concluded that certain areas of the eggs are predetermined to become specific parts of the body. For example, the animal pole becomes the anterior side and the vegetal pole becomes the posterior side. And blastula is simply a mosaic of plastomeres with different potencies for differentiation. Hence, he gave the name to his theory mosaic theory or the determinate development theory. In 1891, Hans Drisch laid down another theory that was the regulative theory. Actually, Drisch was trying Brown's experiment on sea urchin embryos. But to his surprise, separation of blastomeres of sea urchin in a two cell stage or four cell stage produced complete two or four larvae though each of them was smaller in size, right? And thus, he was able to say that the half embryo was able to regulate itself without any missing parts. Thus, he concluded that all blastomeres have equal potencies to develop into complete embryos, right? Next in line came Hans Piemann's theory of organizer. He performed another transplantation experiment. On amphibian eggs, he transplanted the dorsal lip of blastopore from one frog embryo to another. And the result was that the dorsal lip induced the recipient tissue to differentiate into a second embryo. Right? Thus, Hans Piemann and Heil van Gogh gave the concept of embryonic organizer, which is the concept of the dorsal blastoporal lip and that of induction. Right? So now, students, we can differentiate between determinate or mosaic development and regulated development. Whereas, in determinate development, structures are formed simply according to a fixed genetic tissue. Whereas, in regulated development, one tissue affects the subsequent development of another tissue by a process known as induction. Right? So this was all about the history of early development. Now we will move on to the various phases of development. See students, development is a slow but continuous process. It involves a number of phases which are going one after the other and thus they form a continuous cycle of life. As you see here, we have different phases. Fertilization, which means the fusion of the two gametes to form a zygote. 
the zygote that undergoes a process known as cleavage. In cleavage, there is no increase in the size of the cells but simply division of the cells. And the zygote divides to form a number of cells clustered together to form morula first and then when morula develops a cavity called blastocele in itself, it is known as blastula. Now, the blastula will enter gastrulation. During gastrulation, there are certain morphogenetic movements in which the cells move. They move and they move with respect to each other to form the three germ layers, the ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm to form a prospective embryo. Now, after gastrulation, this prospective embryo with the, the three germ layers will undergo the process organogenesis in which different germ layers will form different organs as they are destined to be. Right? Now, once the organism is born, the organism, the young one, may or may not be sexually active. So, those stages are known as larval stages and the larval stages need to undergo metamorphosis in some and once they become sexually mature the adult organisms again lay gametes which undergo the process of fertilization and thus the cycle of development is complete and what happens to the adult organism after he lays the, he and she lays the eggs they undergo senescence so students these are the various phases of development as we have done here. But students, embryonic development is not just differentiation of cells, but it involves a number of other changes as well. Changes in cell shape, the changes in cell motility, the changes in cell fate, the changes in gene differentiation, the gene expression in the cells and so on. And for all these changes, the cells need to have constant interactions among themselves. That means they need to communicate with each other. So the cellular interactions play an important role in development of an embryo. Cellular interactions allow the cells to communicate with each other in response to any changes that are taking place outside during developmental processes. In an embryo, the cells communicate with each other by a number of signal transduction patterns that involve highly diverse and specific protein-protein interactions. So they may act by enzymatically activating some biochemical pathways or even by regulating cytoskeletal proteins, thereby affecting the physiological functions or cell movements in the cell respect. And all these processes culminate in altering the gene expression in the nucleus. Now proteins secreted by a cell that activate a signaling process in another cell are termed the signaling proteins of the ligands, right? And the proteins within a membrane that bind either other membrane associated proteins or signaling proteins are called receptors. As you can see in the diagram here, these are, this is the receptor for this signaling protein. And these receptors or the proteins, they can directly bind to each other as well. As you can see here in the diagram, binding between the same type of receptors is known as homophilic binding, whereas the binding that occurs between different type of receptors is known as heterophilic binding. So the signaling process can be of various types. Number one is the dextracrine signaling. This type of signaling happens between two neighboring cells which are simply touching each other or we can say juxtaposed with each other. This helps in differential cell ability. For example, the signal, not signaling pathway is quite important in cell differentiation during embryonic signaling. Signaling can also be paracrine in nature as you can see in the part B here. When protein synthesized by one cell diffuse through the extracellular matrix over small distances to induce certain changes in the neighboring cells that is known as paracrine process. The paracrine signals can be grouped into one of the four major families on the basis of their structure. The first being the fibroblast growth factor or the FGA family, which transduce signals through receptor tyrosine kinase and JAK type 1. They play important role in cell proliferation, angiogenesis, cell migration, differentiation. Second is the hedgehog family, which has an important role in cell growth, pattern formation, cell fate and body plan. 
the WNT family which includes a large number of cysteine rich glycoproteins and they have important role in cell fate, migration, polarity, neural patterning and organogenesis. Fourth is the TGF beta superfamily which encompasses the TGF beta family, the active in family involved in cell differentiation and apoptosis, the bone morphogenetic proteins or the BMPs, the nodal proteins and the VG1 family which have important contribution in organogenesis of heart, CNS, cartilage, bone and pattern formation and also in axis formation. Now students, among the paracrine signals, when molecules released by a cell bind to ligands present on their own cell membrane, it is known as autocrine signal. And this is important in cell differentiation. And the fourth type of signaling can be an endocrine one. That is when proteins synthesized by a cell diffuse over large distances to induce changes in cells generally present in some other part of the body. And here what is involved? Yes, the hormones. For example, the gonadotrophins, thyroxins and androgens involved in gametogenesis, vitellogenesis, morphogenesis, placentation and even molding. Right? So students, here we also have a great role of small diffusible molecules known as morphogens. Morphogens are basically a category of signaling molecules and they are diffusible in nature. They can determine the fate of the cell by their concentration. Actually, different threshold concentration of these morphogens are capable of regulating different genes because of which different cell fates can be generated. Like high concentration of a morphogen may specify any uncommitted cell to let's say first cell type. But if the same morphogen concentration drops below a certain threshold, the cell fate will change to another type. And if the concentration of that morphogen falls even lower, the cells will be specified in yet a third type of Right. For example, in bicoid and caudal protein in the embryo of fruit fly, Drosophila. Here, as you see in the diagram, bicoid and nanos are the proteins which determine the anterior posterior axis in Drosophila embryo. At the anterior most portion of the Drosophila egg, the concentration of bicoid in both mRNA and protein forms is maximum and it decreases toward the posterior. In addition, the posterior most portion of the egg forms a posterior to anterior gradient of the another transcription factor caudal. Now bicoid and caudal both activate different sets of genes and high amounts of bicoid and little caudal in the anterior part of this embryo induces the formation of head. Right? Now less amount of bicoid and less amount of caudal in the middle portions of the embryo activate genes that generate the thorax. Now little bicoid but plenty of caudal activate genes that form abdomen in the posterior portions of the body. So we can say varying concentrations of bicoid and caudal determine the anterior posterior axis of the prosophila body. But students cells can also communicate with each other through gap junctions that directly connect the cytoplasm of the two cells. Now gap junctions consist of what? You must have studied in your cell biology classes. They consist of the protein connexin. As you can see here, all these are the protein connexins present in six bundles of six here to form gap junctions known as connexins. Now during the process of compaction in mammalian embryos, the blastomeres communicate via gap junction. Also, it has been demonstrated experimentally that in Xenopus, the African clawed frog, if the blastomeres of the blastula are blocked, uh, their gap junctions are blocked by antibodies, it does not allow normal development to take place. So basically gap junctions help in direct passage of signal from one cytoplasm to another. Right? Then we have another set of molecules known as cadherins, which have also a great role to play in cell communication. Now, what are cadherins? Cadherins are a large family of calcium dependent cell adhesion molecules or the CANs which are critical for establishing and maintaining cell adhesion, cell sorting and tissue morphogens. These are transmembrane proteins. On the outside they bind to cadherins as you can see here in the diagram 
they bind to cadherins present on the neighboring cells, which is we can say a homophilic binding. And inside they are bound to the cytoskeletal proteins known as catenins. The diagram is zoomed in here. As you can see, these are the catenins and this is all the cadherin, which, is, which has got a transmembrane channel also. So these cadherin catenin complexes help to hold the cells together. Predominantly, they help in holding the epithelial cells together during epipod. Right? Now the major cadherin types are E cadherin or the epithelial cadherin, which is expressed on all mammalian embryonic cells on the epithelial tissues. They play an important role in radial intercalation that supports epiboli during gastrulation. Or there can be a P cadherin or the placental cadherin, which is present on the placenta. It helps in sticking the placenta to the uterus. There can be N cadherin or the neural cadherin which is expressed on the cells of the developing central nervous system and helps in maintaining and mediating neural signals. Then there can be R cadherin or the retinal cadherin, which helps in the formation of retina. And the fifth category of cadherins are the protocadherins. They are the, actually a distinct class of cadherins that do not have any catenin connections inside the cell and they help in the formation of notochord. Right? Now the type of cadherins expressed on each cell actually govern certain phenomena between the cells. Like uh, they help in governing cell sorting or the cell adhesion among the embryonic cells. So cell adhesion basically means holding the cells together. So I, as I said in the previous slide, adherents present on the epithelial cells help in holding them together during epiboli. If they do not bear adherents, then the epithelial cells will not be able to uh, stick to each other or adhere to each other. Right? The second important function of adherents is Cell sorting or we can say uh, like different type of cells have affinity for each other and they do not have affinity for other type of cells much, right? And this concept of selective affinity between the cells was established by an experiment done by Towns and Hallfelter in 1955, right? So what they did, they actually separated the amphibian neuronal cells and again allowed them to re-aggregate and what they got? They found that the ectoderm is again on the periphery, the endoderm in the inside and the mesoderm in between the cells. So that means that ectodermal cells have a positive affinity for mesoderm and a negative affinity for endoderm, right? While the mesoderm cells have positive affinity for both ectodermal and endodermal cells, right? So that means the kind of affinity between the cells helps in determining like how the cells will sort even if they are separated, right? In 1964, Malcolm Steinberg proposed the differential adhesion hypothesis. And this hypothesis would explain the pattern of cell sorting based on thermodynamic principle. And both of these experiments were based on the role of cadherins in cell sorting. So even the type of cadherin and the amount of cadherin matter. Like what type of cadherin? Is it E cadherin or P cadherin or N cadherin? So the cells which are having a particular type of cadherin will tend to stick together and different from the cells which are expressing some other type of cadherin, right? And even the amount of cadherin is important. More is the cadherin on the cells, more is the connection between them or more is the adhesion. So cadherins also play an important role in altering the cell adhesion during is in chimal generation or during morphogenesis. That is the construction of tissues and organs in the embryo. Now an important such process is epithelial mesenchymal transition or EMT during which a group of epithelial cells change to mesenchymal cells which eventually give rise to mesodermal tissues such as blood, muscle and bone. Now EMT is critical during development. Why is EMT necessary? It actually uh, is necessary for the formation of neural crest cells in the embryo, for the formation of mesoderm in the chick embryos and for the formation of vertebrae precursor cells from the somites. Even in adults, EMT is a process involved in wound healing and cancer metastasis. So basically a group of epithelial cells uh, which have to undergo MBT, they stop expressing E cadherin on them. If there is no E cadherin, that means these epithelial cells do not have cell adhesion between them, right? And thus they start separating from the epiblast and they become part of the basic. Then next is the role of extracellular membrane. 
Now the extracellular matrix or ECM as we generally call it play an important role in cellular interactions during development. ECM provides the substratum for cell adhesion and guidance during cellular movement, differentiation and morphogenesis. It is constituted of an insoluble network of macromolecules which are secreted by the cells and predominantly what is present? Collagen, proteoglycans, for example the heparin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate and a variety of specialized glycoprotein molecules such as fibronectin and lemon. Now the cells communicate through the extracellular matrix via plasma membrane receptors namely integrins. Now, integrins actually are the transmembrane receptors which integrate the extracellular matrix with the cell's interior, helping them to work synchronously. Right? Next, we study pattern formation. Pattern formation is the developmental process by which cells are beautifully organized in a spatial and temporal pattern to form a well organized embryo. Just like the pattern of five fingers in our hand and the two eyes on our face. So pattern formation means the cell types are not just chaotically arranged, but they occur in a well-defined spatial patterns. In the developing embryo, pattern formation enables the egg cells to know their fate. And also it helps in taking up their assigned roles. That is to form specific organs in specific positions with respect to other cells in the embryo. Now pattern formation helps in deciding the overall body plan by defining the main axis of the embryo. As you can see in this diagram, there are major axes, the anterior posterior axis as you see here, which runs from head to tail. Then there is dorsoventral axis, that is to have a distinguishable dorsal side or the back side and a ventral or the front side of the body. Remember these two axes anterior posterior and dorsal ventral are at right angles to each other. Then there can be left right axis that is the one which distinguishes between the two lateral half of the body like we have a left half and a right half in our body and the proximal distal axis that is the proximal portion which is closer and distal one that is far off from the main axis of the body. Like in our arms and legs, we have a proximal region and a distal region, right? Now, pattern formation also helps in translocation and aggregation of cells into three different primary germ layers. That is the ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. Pattern formation also encompasses the change in form or morphogenesis during development. Now students, cells and tissues keep on undergoing migrations and interactions to produce new arrangements and shapes which are composed of multiple tissue layers and each tissue layer will keep on giving distinct organs with distinct functions. Now during gastrulation, embryo develops gut. Extensive cell migrations will occur. So it actually means the pattern formation is the one which helps in making us different from chimpanzees and elephants or even it makes our legs look so different from our arms. Though both contain exactly the same type of cells, the same muscles, cartilage, the same bone, skin, etc. Yet, it is the pattern in which they are arranged is clearly different. Then pattern formation also helps in apoptosis or programmed cell death in an embryo for the formation of certain organs. For example, during hand and foot development. As you see in this diagram, the duck-like primordium and the chick-like primordium development is shown. So as you see, during the development of leg or the feet, webbed feet in case of duck, here you see the blue regions are the portions which have to undergo apoptosis or death. So in duck, the regions of apoptosis are quite small because they have to keep these regions, interdigital regions also with them. Uh, so as to form the webs. Whereas in chick, you can see the interdigital regions have to disappear. So these zones, blue zones, where apoptosis has to take place are quite extensive. So ultimately, these interdigital zones will undergo necrosis or apoptosis, cell death, and it helps in the formation of digits in the 
hands and feet of certain organisms, right? Now, various cellular and molecular mechanisms occur in different organisms at different stages of development, thereby influencing pattern formation. As we discussed in paracrine form of sex signal also in the previous slides, signaling molecules called morphogens are there which help in determining the cell fate and specificity by their threshold value. So same molecules, morphogens help in pattern formation also. As we saw in the case of bicoid and caudal proteins for patterning the embryo of the fruit fly Drosophila, the pattern of bicoid was from anterior to posterior and the pattern of caudal from the posterior to anterior region. So high regions of bicoid develop head, high region of caudal develop the tail or the caudate region and the zones where both are present in less amounts, it develops the thorax. Now pattern formation in animals can be predicted using certain animal or mathematical or computer simulated models. For example, the classical reaction diffusion model proposed by Alan Turing in 1952 has been successfully applied in fish and butterfly pigmentation and also in studying the stripe pattern in zebra by various researchers. So next we study the patterns of growth and differentiation during development. Students, growth is a basic phenomenon of development in all organisms. Growth is defined as an increase in size and weight of a living material, be it a cell or a complete organism. Basically, growth by cell multiplication becomes essential after a certain period of cell growth so as to maintain the correct surface to volume ratio in the cell. However, growth can be positive, that is when the mass of living material increases, but it may also be negative that is when the mass is actually going down also growth may be determinate which means after a certain period of growth the mass does not change much it remains more or less constant for example in human beings or most other mammals or it can be an inter indeterminate time where the mass keeps on increasing that is there are no specific periods of growth then the growth can also be isometric or allometric in nature. Isometric growth is when different organs grow at the same relative growth rate as the rest of the body. More common is allometric growth, which occurs when some organs are growing faster than others. Like human body grows allometrically. As you see in the diagram, from the childhood or we can say from infancy to adulthood, the arms and legs grow at a much faster rate than the head or the rest of the body. That means their growth ratio relative to head is greater than 1. If we plot a coordinated grid of an organism's growth versus time, we get a growth curve. The shape of this curve is often S or sigmoid shape which follows this equation dm by dt is equal to gm where mass is represented by m time is represented by t and g is a coefficient called relative growth rate so in the graph you can see that initially the growth rises slowly then there is a slow rate of growth then it increases steeply then the rate of growth falls down ultimately the growth reaches saturation so this divides the curve into lag phase, exponential phase, senescence phase and ultimately the steady phase which all higher animals undergo during growth in their life. Growth can occur by several mechanisms. The first is hyperplasia that is when cell division is followed by increase in cell size of the daughter cell. Second is hypertrophy when cell keeps on increasing their size without any division. Third is accretion, which refers to increase in deposition of extracellular matrix as observed in the growth of skeletal tissues. So that means that replacement of worn out cells with new ones and increase in turnover of its extracellular material determines the rate of growth in an organism. However, 
During cleavage processes in embryo development, cell division simply occurs without being followed by any increase in cell size. So this is followed by extensive cellular migrations, allowing cells to arrange themselves in primordial germ layers from which different organ rudiments and finally organs could develop. That means that all these cells are undergoing the process of differentiation. So students, what is cell differentiation? Cell differentiation actually means assigning specific function to the cell, which is often accompanied by changes in the size, shape and metabolic activity of the cell. That means which proteins the cell will make now or which signals it will respond to now. Now some cells become neural tissue, some become notochord, some become blood cells and some others differentiate into muscle cells and all this happens during the process of development by differential gene expression as we will discuss in the next few slides. Now it is well known that there is a remarkable role of both extrinsic and intrinsic factors on growth and differentiation and these factors are together known as growth and differentiation factors or the GDFs. In this the extrinsic factors include the nutrients and growth hormones particularly the thyroxin from the thyroid gland, somatotrophin from the anterior lobe of pituitary and to some extent the androgens in humans. While intrinsic factors include various growth factors of paracrine or autocrine nature. So students, cell differentiation involves differential gene expression during the formation of embryo from a zygote which is tutipotent. A zygote is pluripotent. That means it can give rise to any cell type in the adult body. But later in development, the embryonic cells lose this pluripotency and become differentiated, which means they start expressing selective genes as per their function. And this expression of selective genes according to the function is known as differential gene expression. This is the reason why beta globin gene is selectively expressed in developing red blood cells but not in any other tissues. Why? Because beta globin gene is transcribed only in the blood cells. But that does not mean blood cells have lost all other genes or that beta globin gene is now present only in blood cells or deleted from any other differentiated cells of the body. It only means that it remains unused in other cells. Why? Because it is only blood cells which have to form hemoglobin using this beta globin gene. Right? Now most cells retain the entire genome though the unused genes also retain the potential of being expressed. During development, genes are switched on and off at the right time and place for the formation of different gene products that govern the process of development. But how does this differential gene expression occur? The control of gene expression occurs at four sequential steps. The first is differential gene expression level. That means when it has to regulate which genes are to be transcribed into nuclear RNA. The primary mechanism by which genes are turned on or off is through transcription factors, promoters, DNA methylation and histone modification. The second process is at the level of differential RNA processing. So even if a particular nuclear RNA is transcribed, there is no guarantee that it will enter the cytoplasm and create a functional protein in the cell. To become an active protein in the nuclear RNA, this nuclear RNA must undergo RNA censorship. That is, it has to select which nuclear transcripts will enter the cytoplasm as mRNA and which will not. And the second process, it has to be processed by alternative mRNA splicing. That is, that this nuclear RNA be processed by into messenger RNA by the removal of introns and selective combination of exons to form particular proteins which are required by that cell. You must have studied this phenomena of alternate mRNA splicing during your molecular biology classes. So it is the same phenomena which is occurring here. The third control is at the level of selective mRNA translation which regulates which of the transcribed mRNAs in the cytoplasm are translated into proteins. This depends upon how long the mRNA persists in the cytoplasm and where it persists. 
for example the mrnas which are transcribed from the segmentation gene hunchback are distributed throughout the early drosophila embryo but they are translated in to produce functional proteins only where in the anterior region that is in the head and thorax but not in the posterior abdominal regions thus it helps in determining the anterior posterior axis in drosophila then there is also certain control at the level of differential protein modification which regulates the localization of proteins among the complex ecosystem of the cell and sometimes or integrating with other proteins and cofactors in the cell to become functional for example toll receptors which are located all over the cell membrane in the drosophila egg but they get activated only at the ventral side of the egg so the toll receptors on the dorsal side remain inactive and this helps in establishing the dorso ventral polarity in the egg however the expression of mrna is also regulated at certain stages of embryonic development by inhibition from antisense rna and micro rnas that is by rna interference now we discuss the role of cytoplasmic determinants and asymmetric cell division during development students cell differentiation may be brought about by differential localization of certain cytoplasmic determinants in the embryos now what are these cytoplasmic determinants they are actually the maternal mrna molecules or proteins which are donated by the ovum and are localized in selective regions of the egg cell producing cytoplasmic asymmetry now when this cell will divide the cytoplasmic determinants will also be unequally distributed between the two daughter cells so that each of the two daughter cells will also develop differently and this is known as the phenomena of asymmetric cell division this happens at the first cleavage of the nematode egg and defines the anterior posterior axis of the embryo similarly the germ cells of drosophila are also specified by cytoplasmic determinants as we studied earlier in morphogens the bicoid and nanos determine the anterior posterior axis in drosophila embryo similarly in african clawed frog xenopus accumulation of veg t which is again a cytoplasmic transcription factor in the vegetal cells instructs the vegetal cells to become endoderm and when they become endoderm they further signal the marginal zone cells lying immediately above them at the equator region to form the mesoderm so students this is all about today's lecture let us summarize what we have learned today first of all we discussed developmental biology and embryology how the two are different from each other developmental biology means the study of all the developmental phases of an organism right from birth till death whereas embryology only means a study of an embryo that is the phases from fertilization till birth of an individual then we studied the historical perspectives of early embryology followed by various theories of development we also had a look on various mathematical models given by different scientists and how they have been used by different researchers to study various patterns in animal development we also studied the regulative and determinate development and also the developmental cycle we studied various phases which are included in the cycle of life including the fertilization cleavage gestation organogenesis birth metamorphosis senescence and gametogenesis we also studied other different things which have an importance in development of an offspring majorly we studied intercellular interactions pattern formation growth development differentiation then we studied differential gene expression how it takes place then what are cytoplasmic determinants and their role in asymmetric cell division and side by side we studied the role of various proteins and factors predominantly we focused on the morphogens the cadherins and we also studied the role of various proteins which are helpful in determining the axis of the body right so 
so students i hope you all are now in a state to address these questions important in the field of developmental biology how does the fertilized egg give rise to an adult body how does that adult body produce yet another body how can a single fertilized egg cell generate so many different cell types how can the cells in our body organize into functional structures how is cell division so tightly regulated how are the germ cells set apart and what are the instructions that they follow so all the answers to these questions lie hidden in the lecture that we have just discussed these are the books which i have referred for this lecture i hope you had a good time listening to me thank you